All right, our first lesson this morning is on what the Bible says about engagement. And we'll look at the terms we have used throughout the series and of course move on to the one about engagement. We define engagement as the preparation time for marriage after a man and a woman formally decide they want to be married. Perhaps I should add in there the formally decide and announce that they want to be married. And putting this lesson together, of course, some may be skeptical in what does the Bible say about engagement? Does it say anything about engagement? Well, I think that it does. Let's look at the word betrothal. We find that word in the Bible. Now, what's the difference between a betrothal as practiced in Bible times and an engagement? Well, there's not much difference at all, if any. Maybe a betrothal was a little more formal and traditionally more binding. But those are the same, both of those are the same in all essential respects. In fact, if you uh, use the New American Standard Bible, it uses the term betrothed and engaged interchangeably in both the Old Testament and New Testament. Let's look at the three Bible words for betrothal. We have uh, one word in Hebrew and two in Greek. And I think it's fascinating to define those words, to look them up and see what they mean. The first Bible word, Hebrew, <clears throat> means to engage for matrimony. So you have uh, the word uh, engage for engagement in the definition in many of the Bible dictionaries. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 20. Deuteronomy 20. Uh, I want to start in verse 3. And here in the Law of Moses you have some principles uh, in regard to warfare, those who go to war. And there are certain things that when the Israelites were to go to war that the priests were to say and then the officers uh, in charge of the soldiers were to say to, to the people. So the priests were to say, beginning in verse 3, Hear, O Israel, today you are on the verge of battle with your enemies. Do not let your heart faint, do not be afraid, and do not tremble or be terrified because of them. For the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. Then the officers shall speak to the people, saying, What man is there who has built a new house and has not dedicated it? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the battle, and another man dedicate it. And what man is there who has planted a vineyard and has not yet eaten of it? Let him also go and return to his house, lest he die in the battle, and another man eat of it. And what man is there who is betrothed to a woman and has not yet married her? Let him go and return to his house, lest he die in the battle, and another man marry her. So it was important to God that those who were engaged should not go to war immediately, that they should then get married, and then, after the time that they had spent together, then he would be eligible to go to war. So, to God, I think we see that that preparation time for marriage was very important. If you look at the root word for this particular Hebrew word, and I am not a Hebrew or Greek scholar, I'm just looking up in the books and, and showing you what they say. The root word for this is actually the word request. And if you define it, it it's the action of speaking, and what you're speaking is you're, you're, you're voicing a, a longing for somebody, and you're voicing this desire to possess them. And when you think about that particular definition, that fits what we uh, often do today. Uh, you have a man get down on his knee and request her in marriage, to, that he desires that, that they be husband and wife. Will you marry me? And I, I, that fits, I think, the defi definition of the word. It's a spoken uh, request, a spoken uh, longing for someone. In the Greek language, there are two words for betrothal. And looking at this uh, first one, you, if you look at the definition, it means uh, given a souvenir. Given a souvenir or an engagement present. And this present involves a promise that the, the present is given, and that is a promise that they're going to be married. Um, when we go further, 
the, the basic word or the root word of this is to remember or to remind oneself of. So this token of marriage or this engagement present reminds them of the promise that they made. Presence often that we see in Bible times are that of a dowry, that uh, you have a purchase price for the bride, or the bride's family gives her money so that they can have something to, to live on when uh, the, the husband and wife are, are finally married. Uh, in, in our society, we have a given token of the promise of marriage, and that being an engagement ring. And that, that's a promise, a reminder that we're going to get married and, and this time is a time of preparation. The other word in the New Testament for betrothal, when you define it, means to espouse, to be joined or to be fitted together. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 2 where this word is used. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 2. Paul says to the Corinthians, I am, For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Of course, Paul is talking about the work that he has done in uh, converting the Corinthians and uh, helping them mature, uh, preparing them for the time in which they would meet the Lord. And he uses this image of a betrothal. When he, when he uses the word betrothal here in this verse, it's the word fitting together. I'm preparing you to be fitted together with Christ. The root word of this is the word joint. That is the part of the body that, that joins the, the bones together. So uh, that's a great illustration of what it means to be married. And so this is a this betrothal is a time of preparation for joining together as one. And that's a, a picture of an elbow joint. And so, in marriage, they are joined together. They're not to be separated. And when the bones are, are made uh, as a, a child is being born in the womb and, and the child is born normally and grows, those joints are essential to that child's well-being. And, and they all work as they should and hold together. And it's to be reminded that if you're engaged, you're going to be joined together when you say, I do. And you've got to prepare for that. So this is a significant change in your life. And you've got to prepare for that. You've got to get ready. So we'll ask now, for what in marriage should you prepare? As we said before, there's, there's to be a lot of communication in the courtship stage. And now you really have to communicate about specific things and make specific plans. We'll break this down into three categories of things that need to be talked about and discussed and decided on during engagement. Day-to-day -day things uh, that will be a part of the daily life of the marriage. You have to discuss, obviously, living arrangements. All right, Where are we going to live? In what area? Are we going to live in a, in a house or a, an apartment when we get married or, or something else? You, you have to nail that down. You have to decide those things, uh, obviously. Uh, another thing that has to be discussed and decided on are financial obligations and goals. You'd be surprised how many young people don't even discuss these things before they're married. And then once they're married, then they don't know what to do. They don't know how to have a budget or... Uh, and this can be a serious thing in, in marriage. There are a lot of marriages that are in trouble because of financial problems. So you have to deal with this up front. How are we going to pay the bills? How's the money coming in? Somebody has to have a job. There has to be uh, somebody to, to, to earn that money. And I want to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 5 and, and verse 8. And just a reminder to, to the men that God has given you that primary responsibility. In 1 Timothy chapter 5 and in verse 8, But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Now just think about this. A person being described as worse than an unbeliever. Well, how, how could that be? Well, unbelievers understand that they need to provide for their family. And if you're a person who is lazy, you don't want to work for your family, 
you want to sit at home and do nothing, the world is going to despise you and look down upon you. You have to understand you've got a great responsibility uh, to provide for the needs of your wife and your future children. A woman needs to feel secure that you're going to provide for her. And you need to make sure that you are capable of making enough to meet her needs. I mean, what woman is going to be attracted to you if you're not willing to learn a skill and have a decent job? You cannot support a family working minimum wage job at McDonald's. It's not going to work. It just, it just doesn't. So what kind of budget are we going to have? And the two need to sit down and, and discuss that. And uh, well, what about our insurance needs? All right, there's health insurance, life insurance, uh, or car insurance. Well, transportation, you know, that's something that we have to think about. Uh, you know, we, we need a, a car to get to our job or whatever uh, places that we need to go. We need a car to get to church, of course, to, to worship. And, and another thing, you know, they need to discuss how much they're going to give on the, on the Lord's Day. And uh, that's something I think that is worthy of discussion throughout one's marriage as income level changes and so forth. But this is very important. This is part of the preparation stage. You talk about these things, day-to-day -day things. And <clears throat> what this is all about is learning how to be content. Learning how to be content. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5. Let your conduct be without covetousness. And be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now, you could say that this isn't being spoken in the context of marriage because that's what he talks about in the previous verse. And so whether, whether it is you alone or whether you in the marriage relationship, you have to both learn to be content. That covetousness cannot be a, a problem in the marriage. That you want more than you can afford. You might not have a whole lot. And most young folks, when they first get married, don't have much. And there's nothing wrong with that. The problem is, young people think that when they get married, they should have as much stuff as their parents. Oh, they have all of this, so we need all of this. And so they go way into debt to try and accumulate those things at once when that is ridiculous. Uh, consider that it has taken perhaps a long while for your parents to have the things that they do. And you should be content with little or nothing when you start out. When you have one making demands upon the other, trying to pressure them to, to you need to give me all these luxuries, well, that's going to cause stress in the relationship. Be content. We we're reminded of what uh, Paul says to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. The godliness with contentment is great gain. We brought nothing into this world, and certainly we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. Can you be that content in your marriage relationship? All we have is food and clothing. Well, that's what Paul says that you should be. God's going to provide those things if you put Him first. So if this is all you have, don't think that you're, you're miserable. When you have each other and you have the Lord, you have everything. So here, they're preparing themselves to be content. There are family things that need to be discussed. Obviously, children. And it's probably a good idea to discuss these things in courtship, what kind of expectations you have. All right, we're going to have children. Well, how soon? How many? All right, uh, if we're going to wait a while, what method of birth control are we going to use? You need to, you need to talk about that and settle that before the wedding night. All right, with children, uh, how are we going to educate them? Are we going to homeschool them? Are we going to send them to public school or... or Maybe something else. How are we going to discipline them? How are we going to raise them to uh, adulthood? And uh, the principles for that need to be agreed ahead of time. 
and both of you stick to them. And really throughout the training of your children, the principles stay the same, though sometimes the methods will obviously have to change as they get older. And uh, being a parent is, is not an easy thing. It's, it's, it's like on-the-job training. And, and it seems, and I've heard a lot of uh, couples say this, that uh, by the time they figured out how to do it, the kids were already grown. <laughs> so, uh, but again, that's something that you both have to work at, and you need to start discussing it now. You need to talk about in-laws, because in-laws have an impact on your marriage. And somebody once said that, well, if, if you marry her, you're marrying your family, her, her family. And that's, that's very true to some degree. And so there are going to be two sets of in-laws, and uh, they're all wanna, going to see you and see your kids, uh, their grandkids. And so you've got to figure out how to balance the visits and, and invitations and so forth. And uh, you've you got to draw acceptable boundaries as far as, uh, you know, they, they need to let you have your own space and all of that. You work all of that, all of that out. Uh, when, when I was growing up, my grandparents lived two houses down from us. And they were my dad's parents. And so mom and dad, you know, get married and... and have me and then Brian. But at first, Mom said that uh, she's a little bit skeptical about having her in-laws that close. But it worked out great because they understood, my grandparents understood, they needed to keep their distance. All right, They didn't come over unless they were invited. And, and just the dynamic worked great. And, and from my standpoint, I loved having my grandparents. Just I could just walk to their house. Uh, because uh, they tended to spoil us, but we there. <laughs> but that's something you have to, to, to work out and, and understand. And, and maybe one set of in-laws is more understanding than another. It, but you just have to, to work through those things. And, and they can be a blessing. You know, let your in-laws be a blessing. And I was blessed to have a mother-in-law and father-in-law that, that, that I had. And I uh, thank God for, for both of them. And they have passed away ten years ago, but they are, they are sorely missed. In regard to family, you, you've got to decide on the rules of the household. How are you going to make decisions? Now, of course, there is the there are the roles that God has given, both the husband and wife. Maybe we'll talk a little bit about that in the next lesson. But you have to have this process of making decisions that he has to listen to her input, they have to talk it over together, uh, and, and this is something that uh, you've got to work out together. Uh, how are we going to work together? How are we going to grow, grow closer together? You have to make plans on, on growing closer, how you're going to do that over the years. And I think also you need to have rules for avoiding infidelity. Um, it's not that Sonia and I ever worried that the other one would cheat on the other, and that's not it at all, but we have certain rules and we have from the beginning. And it's one of the rules is that uh, me as a preacher, if I study with someone, I am not to study with a female alone. Okay? It doesn't mean that I would have a problem. I don't know if the other person has a problem and it doesn't look good. And so that's one of the things we're not to spend time alone with the opposite sex at all. If I'm studying with a woman, Sonia's going to be with me. And so that's a rule that, that we have set. And also, it, you, you need to, to think about that it's not a good idea to have extended conversations uh, with a person of the opposite sex, whether on email or Facebook or wherever. That's just not appropriate. Now, I'm not saying you don't communicate with the opposite sex. I'm saying if there's just this constant correspondence with you and, and this other person, that is, is not a good idea. That is not a good idea. So have those rules and stick to them. And uh, I, I think they will be of great value to you. And again, what you're preparing to do is to fulfill your roles as God has given you. Well, you've got to decide some things that have to do with God. And again, we have emphasized over and over that God has to be the number one part of your relationship. 
So you have to decide about spiritual activities. Obviously, where are we going to worship? You know, a friend of ours in Florida who was going to one congregation in the Tampa area married uh, this young lady who was going to congregation, another congregation in the Tampa area. Well, they had to decide, well, where are we going to go? Because you don't want to go to different congregations. <laughs> of course, that's not, that's not good at all. You need to share your spiritual uh, life together. Uh, so you decide where you're going to worship, and uh, you, you go where you're going to be uh, best uh, encouraged and where you can encourage other people. Of course, it's nice to have that option in Tampa. You don't quite have, we don't quite have that option up here since there are fewer congregations. But even with an, in an area where there's just one congregation, you still decide this is where we're going to place our membership, and this is where we're going to be active, and this is what we're going to do, and this is how we're going to help our brethren. You have to also decide about how you're going to encourage one another. Prayer and study time together. And we had uh, quoted from 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7, talking to the husbands to dwell with their wives with understanding and give them honor so that the prayers may not be hindered. And again, Peter says that well, you, you should be praying together. So that's something that you need to make sure that you start doing from the very beginning. Spiritual goals. How can we grow in faith together? How can we help others grow? And all of this is preparation for living because our goal together is to get to heaven together. All right, you've got to prepare and discuss all these things. Now, I asked uh, my friends on Facebook for input about engagement. And I asked, what do you think are the greatest mistakes made in engagement? And there were a lot of people who responded, and a lot of people responded privately about this. And when, when I put all that together, there were two main answers, and it was pretty consistent. And, and some people spoke by experience. And the engagement mistake, number one, it seems in the minds of most people, is rushing too fast into it or having too short of an engagement time. Now, understand that there is risk in marriage. And there's risk in a lot of things in life when you think about it. There's risk in buying eggs at the store. Okay? But how do you minimize that risk? Well, you open up the carton and see if there's any broken eggs. Hey, okay? no problem there. Well, you understand that you shouldn't rush into marriage if you haven't examined the other person closely enough. <coughs> you don't want to marry a rotten egg, right? <laughs> so we spent a lot of time talking about that yesterday on courtship. You, you find out about them. Now, in engagement, uh, the discussion continues, obviously, and you have to iron out the details, we, as we just talked in the previous chart. Iron out those plans. But if you're such a person where you start, start liking somebody, oh, I really like them, and then your mind is instantly on, on marriage, let's get married, um, you, you've skipped a lot of important steps, and you're being very rash and impulsive. You can't rush into this. Everything leading to marriage should be carefully and thoughtfully considered. So don't rush into it too fast. Don't rush into it before you truly trust one another, before you trust yourself, too. Now, I talked a little bit about trust yesterday. A large degree of trust should already be there prior to engagement. But there are certain important things about trust that must be there before marriage. Do you trust him or her to always be loyal to you? Do you really trust them? Because if the one that you are courting or the one to whom you're engaged has a wandering eye, do not think that when you get married, that wandering eye will go away. It will not. If they have a wandering eye and they're looking after other people, then get out of the relationship before you're married. This is a 
Big danger sign. And if you know they have a wondering eye, how can you trust them fully? And make sure you don't have one of those yourself. Let's go to Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, verse 22. I said I talked a little bit about the roles. Here we go. Ephesians 5, verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he's the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wife be subject to their own husbands in everything. Now, this is a difficult step to take. Okay? And us men need to understand that. That when a woman says, all right, I'm willing to submit to you. It takes a lot of trust in you and a lot of faith in you for them to do that. And we should not let them down by mistreating them. But to the women, are you ready to trust his leadership? <clears throat> are you ready to voluntarily submit to him? You can call this a willing followership. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to let him have this role of leader? And you take a step back. Now, this is not of a... Uh, what is the word I'm looking for? This is, this is not a disadvantage to you. Because you have a Savior who looks out for your needs. And now you're going to have a husband... If he is godly and behaves godly, he will look out for your needs. So you've got double benefit. But you have to be willing to let him lead in that way. Or else, if you feel you don't trust him and you have to, you have to lead for him, well, there's going to be a power struggle in that marriage, and that's going to be a miserable place for both of you. So you've got to trust one another on these things before you get married. And you're building on that. You're preparing for that in engagement. Are you rushing in marriage before one or both of you is mature enough? Now, we've quoted from Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24. We'll look at it again quickly. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. Now, men, are you ready to make a nest of your own? Are you mature enough? Are you both mature enough that, all right, I'm not going to go crying to mommy and daddy when things go a little tough. All right, am I mature enough to sit down with my spouse and work things out? Go back to Ephesians 5 and verse 25. Ephesians 5, 25. All right, husbands. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now men, are you like Christ? <coughs> Ready to give your life for hers? Sometimes us guys say, yeah, we, we'd stand in front of a car and sacrifice ourselves to save our wife. All right, that's noble and that's good. But we need to do this on a, in a lot of other areas in life, in, in smaller ways. We have to protect her. We have to protect her feelings and make sure that we're not the ones who are mistreating her. Jesus never mistreated anybody. And here, we have to be like him. Are you ready for that? Are you ready for this servant leadership? Yeah, you're leading, but you are you're serving her. And that's the purpose of your leading. Are you ready for that kind of leadership? Are you mature enough to understand what this is? Some rush too fast into engagement and hence marriage because they're thinking that marriage will solve some other problems. Perhaps one of them has a very bad family life. Maybe they're being mistreated by their, their parents or other people in the family. And they want to get out of that. They want to get out of the house. And so I'm going to find somebody to marry so I can escape that. That should not be the reason you get married. Let's 
Sometimes people get married to someone because they're very much in debt, and so they find somebody who they think has a lot of money, and that will solve my financial woes. I know somebody who that was their motivation. That should not be the reason to get married. Some get married because they want to cover up embarrassment. Embarrassment of an out of wedlock pregnancy. Made a mistake. Committed fornication. Oh no. She's pregnant. Now we have to get married. I do not believe in shotgun weddings. Now, you both sinned. You both made a mistake. You need to repent of that. That doesn't mean you have to get married because if you don't love one another, then you're going to make a bad situation worse. Now, I would say, men, that if, if you have caused somebody to be pregnant, even though you may not get married, you need to see financially to that. You have a responsibility to that, to that woman and that baby being born. And you've got to work that out, what that is. It may be that she's not going to have anything to do with you anymore. But whatever it is, make sure that this is not the reason that you marry someone. You are engaged because you are already 100% sure you want to be married to that person for the rest of your life. And I want to emphasize that would highlight it, circle it, put stars beside it, arrows to it. This is important. If you get nothing out of the lesson this morning, you have to get this. And if you're not 100% sure about this person or about getting married, hold off. Hold off. Wait. So this is engagement mistake number one. Rushing too fast into it. Being too impulsive or too short an engagement time to where you don't have sufficient time for preparation. All right, mistake number two. And that is too long of an engagement <laughs> or an open-ended engagement where you haven't set the date and you know, it's months that have gone by, maybe years, and you still don't know when you're going to get married. You know, she's wearing the engagement ring. Oh, when's the day? I, I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea when, when the day is. We haven't decided. Uh, and this can be a huge problem. I, I've heard of circumstances where people have been uh, engaged for, for many years before they got married. And it causes problems. And if this is the case where you haven't set a date and it's a very long time, you have to honestly evaluate what's the real reasons for a long delay. What, what is that? Now, there are some circumstances in which there has to be a delay. If someone is in the military and gets sit, sent over, uh, perhaps that delays the time in which they can make those type of plans. But that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about where here they are, they have access to one another, uh, they're seeing one another still, and they're engaged, and why, why the delay? Well, it seems to me like the problem may be one of insecurity. They're insecure. Or there are problems that have come up, doubts that have come up that weren't there before, and so they kind of delay things. And certain things need to be addressed first, and, and then it takes time. Well, if there's a long delay, then the relationship may stagnate or become even more insecure than before. But I think the biggest danger is what we talked about yesterday, that the two can become physically intimate before marriage. I want to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Corinthians 7, uh, verses 1 and 2. Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. So Paul is beginning to answer questions from the Corinthians, and we don't have the list of the questions, we just have the answers here. And he says it's good for a man not to touch a woman. Now, he doesn't say it's better for a man not to touch a woman. Okay, That would be the Catholic position in regard to their priest. That, that's not what's being said here. It is morally acceptable to God if you want to remain single. And I, I think that's what he's saying. And that was the position that Paul was in. He was not married. 
But nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let, let each man have his own wife, and let each woman have her own husband. So, he's saying that if you have two people that care for one another, well, get married. Right? You don't stay engaged indefinitely because of this problem, because of sexual immorality. Let each man have his own wife, and each woman her own husband. All right, let's go further down in the text to verses 8 and 9. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them if they remain even as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. So, with passion is, is, is added there by the translators. It may mean to burn in hell. So it could be either, either one that is meant there. So again, get married. Don't delay until it becomes a big temptation. Because, as we have said before, you have no right to act like you're already married. No right whatsoever. So, an application of, of all of this from these mistakes is when you decide you want to get married and you're engaged, just set a reasonable, mutually agreed upon time. Don't rush into it and don't prolong it. So, these are the two greatest mistakes in, in uh, engagement. If you can think of others that I could add to the lesson and, and preach later, please let me know. I would love to include it in the series. All right, I've got two more charts. And, and uh, I'll try and, and rush through these. As far as a wedding from a man's point of view, I think it's, it's interesting when you define the term bride and what it means. And I had no idea when I defined these terms what I would find. And when you look up the word for bride in Hebrew, it, you, it's defined as a bride as if perfect. Well, well that's fascinating. A bride as if perfect. You look at the root word for that uh, word bride, and it is the word perfect, perfect in beauty. And it's used in Ezekiel 27 to talk about how beauty the city of Tyre was. It was unique and very beautiful there on the coast of, of the Mediterranean Sea. So from a man's standpoint, when he sees the bride, there's, there's nothing more beautiful than perfect in all the world. And, and every groom focuses on the beauty of the bride on the wedding day had some friends who were asked to be best man and uh, bridesmaids and they were all nervous about how they looked and I said nobody's going to be looking at you <laughs> they'll be looking at the bride They're looking at her beauty so from a man's stand standpoint she's very beautiful during that time in the Greek bride means a betrothed woman a bride or recently married and when you look further, it's, it describes one who wears the veil. Now that has been a tradition for a long, long time. They're wearing a veil in the marriage ceremony and lifting it. But she wears the veil and lifts it for one man. You notice that in the ceremony. She lifts it only for him. I want to be his, is what she's saying. And so it is describes a woman who wishes to become a man's wife. Now from the guy's standpoint, from his point of view, He's thinking, you know, as they're up there, wow, she actually wants to be married to me. <laughs> you know, I'm lucky. Or, or better yet, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. Now, every girl pictures what her wedding day is going to be like. Okay? Every part of that day, every detail is important to her. It's her special day. Now, the guys just show up, you know. <laughs> but, but this is important to her. Now, this is the closing chart, and I'll try and speed up for time. Try and get this in five minutes here. This is the proposal and wedding from her point of view. And, and there are some fascinating parallels in Scripture here that I think that we need to see. First, he proposes to her in sincere love. Now, isn't that what Jesus has done to us? He's proposed to us. Come to me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Well, before she can say yes to the proposal, she has to come to believe in him as a person. Okay? You have to have that trust that we talked about in courtship. I, I believe in him. I, this is the one. And, and you see, that's what we do 
when we come to Christ, we have to first believe in Him and trust in Him. And that's what faith is all about. And let me just go to uh, Hebrews 11 and verse 6, talking about faith, but without faith it's impossible to please Him, for he who comes to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. You see, we believe in His existence, and we believe in His character. And we trust in Him. We know that He loves us. And so, before we can come to the Lord, we, we have to believe, just as she needs to believe in Him as a person before she marries Him. When she says yes and becomes engaged, she has to be willing to change her mind about her lifestyle and be ready to give herself completely to Him and to Him only. Because you can no longer live as a single person. You're, you're preparing now to be part of this unit. It's one flesh, but there are two people in there. And your life is going to change. So you've got to change some things. And that's what we have to do, too, as well. We have to repent when we're going to come to the Lord. And say, I'm not going to do my own thing anymore. I'm going to follow you, Lord, and, and to be with you. And I don't have time this morning, but... Jose uses this type of imagery of betrothal and preparing for marriage. And you have Hosea uh, talking to his, his wife, well, the one to be, he's to, mar to be married, Gomer, as they're coming back together again. And he tells her, you, you, have, you have to change, you have to come to me now, because she had previously sought after other men. In the Gospels, John the baptizer is called the friend of the bridegroom. And so you have that image there of, of a wedding. And, and John's purpose was to make preparation, to prepare the people for, for the, the bridegroom. And how did he prepare the people? He told them to repent. He told them to repent. All right, the next point. On the wedding day, she must be willing to pledge her loyalty to him in a vow before others. Now, and this is her point of view as they both take those vows. But she does it in front of other people, and that has great meaning, as we are to confess our faith in Jesus before others, if we want Him to confess us to His Father and to the angels in heaven. Next, after she says, I do, she must be willing to make contact with the groom and kiss him, duh, when, when she is instructed to do so. And how do we come into contact with the Lord? Well, we are baptized. We're baptized. That's how we. That's the step that we take to officially become a Christian. And because of time, I'll encourage you to read Ephesians 5, because back in that chapter again, in the relationship between Christ and the church, you have this wedding. Christ preparing His bride through the washing of the water by the Word. <coughs> Baptism is that is that point. Next, she joins in the announcement to the happy crowd that she now carries his name. Now, I introduce to you Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so. She has his name now. And we take on Christ's name when we're baptized. And worthy of study is Isaiah chapter 62, which is beautiful, in talking about betrothal and then marriage. God says to his people, I will give you a new name give you a new name. And then, from his standpoint, he rejoices in his marriage to her. And I will take time for this. Revelation chapter 19, Revelation 19, verses 7 and 9. Let us glad, be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous act of the saints. Then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. Chapter 21 and verse 2. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and He will dwell with them, and they shall be His people, and God Himself will be with them and be their God. It's a beautiful, 
beautiful passages there. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There'll be no more pain, for the foreign things have passed away. Verses 9 and 10. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. You know, the Bible often uses the proposal and the wedding to illustrate the joining of a person to God. And we have this beautiful image of God being joined to His people in the end, as they will be together forever in heaven. <coughs> when you think about how precious the proposal day is and the wedding day is to us, time just seems to stop on that day because He wants to record that special moment. And that's the way it is when we're converted to Christ. Time just stops because this is so wonderful that we can come to Christ. And it is our special day. And again, the life together should be a life of great celebration as God rejoices in us being with Him. And so we'll stop right there. We'll break for a few minutes and then start our worship service.